<laughs> well, it's a very great pleasure to uh, reintroduce Dr. Brett Genevi of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. In May 2013, as uh, Harold mentioned, she gave us a very illuminating talk about what we learned about Mercury from the images that were obtained by the Messenger spacecraft. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in geology from Northwestern University and a PhD from the University of Hawaii, where she studied the composition and evolution of the lunar surface by using visible and near-infrared spectroscopy. After research at Arizona State University, she joined the Applied Physics Laboratory uh, at Johns Hopkins. Much of her work is concerned with the mapping and geology of the rocky bodies of the solar system, the moon, mercury, and asteroids such as Vesta. She studies how the rocky crusts of these bodies develop and how they have been modified by volcanoes and by impacts. Last June, she published a remarkable article in Physics Today about how new data has forced us to revise our understanding of the moon and produced changes in our picture of how the Earth came to be as it is today. We're very fortunate this evening to learn from Dr. Genevi about these new developments. All right. So a lot of um, what I uh, plan on talking about tonight was also kind of the subject of this Physics Today article, which kind of inspired me to take stock of you know what's what really is new with the moon right now what we knew in terms of the data we have um, new in terms of old data that we've gone back to revisit and um, new in terms of just our, our way of thinking of um, what we know of the moon sometimes you know we've gone forward made huge leaps and sometimes we actually have to take a step back and reevaluate some of the some of the older things that we thought we knew. So um, the background here, I'll just mention since we've been staring at it for a while, is a Tycho crater here. Um, so probably most of you are familiar with Tycho since you can see it um, quite, quite easily. <laughs> um, a, a large raid crater on the southern near side. And here's just an oblique view for the, from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. Uh, the, the central peak of that crater in the, in the middle there. All right. PC. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So um, a little uh, history that will just lead up to where we are now and why we've had so many um, so much new information. You know, the dawn of the space age really focused a lot on the moon. And we had over 40 lunar missions in this pretty short period of time between 59 and 76. And so that must have been totally incredible to be a part of, with the Luna Zon, Ranger, Surveyor, Landers, Lunar Orbiters, which got some of the most incredible images of the moon early on. And then, of course, the Apollo programs. And of those, you know, many orbital or even, you know, the Rangers just or impactors, but there were 17 landings on the moon. So 1972, the last person on the moon, uh, Apollo 17. It's kind of um, both fun and sad to, I, I talked to a lot of kids and, you know, when do you think the last person was on the moon? Last week! <laughs> last night! <Friday. laughs> like, no, it was before I was born. <laughs> so, um, and then, you know, 1976, was um, the last uh, Soviet landed mission with Luna 24 <coughs> there uh, on the right. Oh, the space bar does not work. All right, and then we had this long drought of lunar exploration. You know, there was planetary exploration happening in, in here some, but between 1977 and 2006, there were two missions to the moon. One was the Clementine Orbiter, which actually um, was primarily a, a Department of Defense mission um, that was a, a, apparently some kind of technology demonstration. And then there were people involved with it, <coughs> new lunar scientists, and said, all right, you know, let's do something with this. And it was actually quite revolutionary for, for um, lunar remote sensing. And then the Lunar Prospector mission uh, in 1998 
which orbited and gave us um, really interesting elemental information um, and uh, magnetic uh, data. So that's through 2006. And then we've had this fantastic period of lunar exploration um, since then. Um, there were, and it, it's truly been international. Um, the Kaguya uh, spacecraft, also known as Selene from Japan, an orbiter with a very sophisticated set of remote sensing instruments. We learned a lot about the composition, mineralogy of the moon. Um, Chang'e 1, uh, from uh, the um, Chinese National Space Agency, which was a, you know, a bit of a, a development, a first step in their program. Chandrayaan one from uh, India had a, um, it did have one NASA instrument, but also had a lot of particles. We learned about the plasma environment of, uh, around the moon. And then the NASA instrument was the first imaging spectrometer of the moon. So we learned a lot about the mineralogy and actually the, the water, the hydration of the moon. Um, LRO, that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, I work on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera, um, so I'll tell you a bit more about that, but it has a huge suite of instruments. It was actually launched um, as part of NASA's exploration mission directorate at the time. It was going to be the first in a series of um, missions that would ultimately be part of the Constellation program, uh, human uh, landings on the moon, human exploration of the moon. The Constellation program was canceled uh, by the following administration, so <laughs> it's hard to, to do long-term exploration when political winds shift um, because it, it is a, a big budget involved. Uh, LCROSS was launched with LRO. It impacted uh, into a, a permanently shadowed crater at the South Pole. Uh, Chang'e 2. Um, Grail. <laughs> I don't know if I have time to go through all of these. I'll just mention Chang'e 3 was the first landing since 1976. You can see the small rover down there. That was the U-2 rover. So the first um, landing since 1976 was in 2013. It's quite amazing. <laughs> so um, that is, uh, will make up um, kind of the, the bulk of what we know now that's really um, changed the way we think about a lot of the problems and showed us really new interesting science. Um, so the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, launched in 2009 and this is, um, I put this up here, this is showing topography and kind of a, a, an animation of the spacecraft flying over the surface just because you can go to our website and we have a, a really beautiful website with all these images on here but there's this fun feature where you can actually, um, it's called uh, the quick map. You can see all of our data we've acquired and then you can actually track the spacecraft in real time. You can put any kind of, you know, uh, topography, any kind of the maps underneath and then follow along with the spacecraft where it is right now, um, still orbiting the moon. So the camera I mentioned, um, that's the instrument that I work on. Um, was designed, I mentioned, you know, as one of its main goals was actually uh, scouting landing sites. Um, and it has done that. It scouted the Chang'e 3 landing site, for example, that this data has really played an important role in shaping um, where future landings will go. Um, and it was very high resolution because you need to be able to see things on the scale of something that will affect where a rover will go, that will affect where a spacecraft can land um, safely. So we have 50 centimeter per pixel images. And um, you can see an example here of the Apollo uh, 12 landing site. And I'll put on some labels here just so you can see what we're looking at. Um, there's the, the descent module. Here you can see actually the four little foot feet around there, the, the foot pads. Um, you can see these trails here. Yeah. These dark areas are actually um, not quite footprints, but those are where the astronauts walked. And you can see their paths, even though our, our pixels aren't quite, you know, as small as the foot, they've kicked up dirt around them as they walked and left these little trails. And you can see for all the landing sites, and all the places they explored here, at the top, LSEP equipment, that's where they left um, 
some of the scientific equipment behind that um, uh, monitored the uh, for earthquakes or moonquakes and things even after um, they left. Oh, and I should mention, of course, that <laughs> Apollo 12 was the pinpoint landing demonstration because it didn't go so well on Apollo 11. They didn't land exactly where they had hoped, and so they proved that they could do a pinpoint landing by landing right next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft there, which you can see is a little white dot in the center of a darker area that was disturbed around it. Um, and so they actually went and looked at it and saw how it had weathered there on the surface for a while. So um, I was going to go through a, a few topics. <laughs> really know how much time we have, so um, maybe we'll do three out of four and you can, you know, pick your favorites or something here. Um, but talk a bit about the late heavy bombardment, um, which has been deemed one of the, well, it has been deemed by the National Academies, a panel they can mean to be like the number one question in lunar science because it affects all of the solar system, really. Um, the present day impact rate uh, lunar volcanism, particularly recent lunar volcanism, and then the question of water ice on the moon. Um, so, the moon is cratered, as all of you know. And the reason that we care so much about these craters is because um, all of the same impact or population was hitting the Earth as well. And so we don't have that record preserved on Earth. You know, we have impact craters scattered around. But we certainly have lost most of the record, especially the early record of bombardment. And so, um, just to, to highlight how cratered it really is, this is just showing every crater larger than five kilometers in diameter. And um, you'll see some quite big ones there, including the Imbrium Basin. So the Imbrium Basin is you know, this big area here that's been filled in later by mare basalts lavas um, from numerous volcanic eruptions of varying composition. But the Imbrium Basin is over 1,100 kilometers across. We know that it formed 3.84 billion years ago, so right um, at the earliest point that we really have uh, rocks that we have the record for on Earth. Um, and if this impact event had occurred on the Earth, and surely similar ones did, um, it would have vaporized the oceans, it would have sterilized the crust to depths of hundreds of meters. So this would have been a big deal. And you can see one of the reasons that um, these are questions that go well beyond the moon is that um, you know, this was right around the type, time that we think early life was emerging on Earth. And so if you have um, a big impact like this, that's going to be an event that could severely affect um, what was going on on Earth. And we have not just the Imbrium Basin at around 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, but we have dates, we think, for some of these other basins, and they are all around the same age. And so this has led to the idea that there was a late heavy bombardment. And late, because um, you know, when the solar system was forming 4.6 billion years ago, we think that accretion of the planet should have happened relatively rapidly. All of the biggest <coughs> impactors that were out there, these planetesimals, they would have been swept up relatively rapidly. And so, um, sometimes you know, within a hundred million years, even something. So to have these. Um, large impacts happening much later. So it's quite early in our solar system, but it's still late. Um, so that's why we call it the late heavy bombardment. And then in this grouping right around the same time um, is, um, well, it's a surprise based on how we think, um, you know, the solar system formed and evolved. And then it would be a big problem for life because if you're having not just one of these big impacts on Earth around the same time, that life is forming, life needs some time to reestablish itself after it, you know, these catastrophic events. So a lot of people are interested in how this played out, especially because, um, well, I think I have that on the next slide here, um, because of this question here. So this is going to loop through a few times here, and I'll try and explain 
what we're looking at. So um, how do we explain that the reason for all of this late um, bombardment? One of the ideas has been, um, uh, call it, you may have heard of the Nice model, also the, the, all kinds of variants now, Grand Tac. And really what that's trying to describe is where did this impactor population come from? Um, so we're looking here um, at <laughs> the, when it comes back, yeah, here, all these green dots are models of what objects would be um, uh, out in the, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, wait for it to come back around. So yeah, objects that when you have this migration of orbits for um, Jupiter and Saturn, you have these Kuiper Belt objects that were in these stable orbits, and then you get this resonance between um, when the orbits of the giant planets start moving, and this throws all of these objects that had been in stable orbits out here um, into total chaos, and they go flying throughout the, well, they go flying in every direction, but also um, you know throughout the inner solar system there. And so that is this model that um, when you look at, you know, the whole solar system as a whole can try to explain what we see on the moon. And that, that's where this came from, is how do we explain these weird observations on the moon. But then if you go down this path, now you have a really interesting story that um, is not just um, impacting um, you know, life forming on Earth, but it's also, you know, these are icy objects in the Kuiper Belt. You're delivering um, volatiles, water, to the inner solar system as well. So um, what I want to do now is kind of step back and take another look at this question. So first is, you know, how do we know um, these ages that I've shown you here? Um, well, we um, think we know them from because we've collected samples on the moon at certain sites. So um, you can see um, fifth, Apollo 15 and 17 um, were right along the edges of these basins. So Apollo 15 was right on the rim of the Imbrium Basin nearly. And the same with Apollo 17, um, nearly on the rim of Serenitatis. And then uh, the Luna 20 was a sample return uh, mission from the Soviet <coughs> Union. Um, they brought back um, fragments of one would think Crucium Basin because of where it landed. And then the Apollo 16 landing site, the Nectaris Basin's actually kind of hard to see here because it's not all filled in, but here's the rim stretching along here. And then the Apollo 16 uh, landing site may have collected samples from Nectaris. So those are the um, absolute ages we have from bringing those samples back to the lab, um, making a presumption about their origin based on their context here, their geologic context. And then um, you know, radiometric, radiometric uh, dating of those samples. Um, but we have another thing to look at here, relative ages. Um, so I'm a geologist, and this is like your first law, the law of superposition here, where the oldest materials on the bottom, younger materials, rocks as they form, end up on top. And so we can try to do that in a relative sense um, on the moon. It's easy when you have things like here's an old surface and here is a younger volcanic flow that has come and covered up some of that older surface. But you know, it gets harder when you're trying to say which of these two craters is older. You can do things like, well, here's one crater and here are rays coming from another and secondary craters and some of those have covered up, have superposed this younger crater. So we can get a relative um, sense there. And that's what we've tried to do with the basins. And we've made up a story of which ones came in which order. Um, we can also do crater size frequency distribution, which um, actually I, I was showing, my son was looking over my shoulder tonight and he asked, you know, why aren't there as many craters here as there are over, you know, the southern near side here? That's a great question, <laughs> because this area is younger. You know, this formed, this the darker surfaces were uh, volcanic flows that, that occurred much later in time, um, still old, but you know, between you know, two and three billion years ago. So they haven't had as much time to collect impact craters compared to the um, older uh, highlands terrain. 
so we do that with the basins. And um, interestingly, the lunar orbiter um, images were, um, in the 1960s, our best source of um, images where you could look at the morphology of the moon. So they had um, very high resolution. Sometimes they were up to kind of the equivalent. They were actually taken on Polaroid film and scanned in the spacecraft and sent back. So, you know, it's a little fuzzy sometimes, but they were up to, you know, like a couple meters per pixel equivalent uh, resolution, um, if you scan those in now. Um, and they had, the sun was low in the sky, so topography was casting shadows. You could see what was on the surface pretty well. But this area of the moon didn't have um, the best image, image coverage, and surprisingly didn't have the best coverage until the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So um, this is a zoomed out view, but when we're looking at a higher resolution. And so when we're trying to look at just, say, these three basins, Imbrium is very clear. It's the youngest. You can see it has littered the near side um, with its ejecta. And you can actually see some of the scars of material that's come out from Imbrium here. Um, but these others are older, and then it gets harder to tell. So um, with the new image data, where we're able to look at the number of craters on these different basins, also this is to, uh, topography where dark, called dark is um, uh, low and light is high in elevation. And we can start to see that actually there is some of the chrysium ejecta on top of the Serenitatis Basin. And this was actually not what was expected. The whole story that we had been able to create was that Serenitatis was younger than Chrysium. So we have this new picture. We have um, relative ages here. Serenitatis came first, Chrysium came next, and Imbrium uh, came third. So um, this was the original story here. If we have um, just trying to tell the story of what happened um, between the time that Serenitatis formed and Imbrium formed. <coughs> and if you place those in the original order, you had Serenitatis forming, and then you had a couple other basins forming, and then you had the Imbrium basin forming. And that's all um, within a relatively short period of time. And now, um, when we have to reorder this based on the new information we have about the relative ages of all the basins, we now know that Serenitatis formed, and then somewhere um, more than 20 other basins may have formed, and then the Imbrium Basin. And um, why that matters is that that's a really short, period of time between those two, 50 million years. If you have really that many basins coming all in that huge time, that's actually much more of a cataclysm than this late heavy bombardment had even predicted. This is like a huge, um, it would have been, you know, a, <laughs> a true cataclysm um, on Earth. Um, oh, I can't go back. Let's see. All right. Um, but now we also have another question. We now have reordered the way we think these basins form, but now we're questioning how well do we really know these, these ages? Because we have the Apollo 15 landing site here, the Apollo 17 landing site here, but the Imbrium Basin would have completely littered the near side with its ejecta. And there's been another study recently that actually um, has looked at these areas in detail. This is the Apollo 17 landing site right here. And the date for the Serenitatis Basin comes from rocks that rolled down these hills and were collected at the bottom. So at what scale are these images? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. So this is, I think, something like 10 kilometers across here, this, this um, lower part. Um, but yeah, this is fairly high resolution. Um, so yeah, you can't see where the lander would be exactly here, but um, right around in here. Um, so we think that all of this kind of modeled material here 
from the new images we have has been um, pretty conclusively shown to be actually imbrium ejecta. So the imbrium basin, even though we're a little rim of serenitatis, has just kind of littered the area. Imbrium is this way uh, with its own ejecta. So we now are questioning even some of these far distant ages, Nectaris, um, all of these ages. We may have been going around the near side and picking up samples from the same basin over and over again. Um, and we, we really don't know the answer to that yet. Um, you know, doing this field work can give you a lot of context with the astronauts going around and picking up these rocks. But I think um, probably many would agree that if we wanted to answer this question, which wasn't really on the radar necessarily of the people who were planning these missions at the time, we would probably pick different sites. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing is looking for sites where we can answer this question. So um, this is the Oriental Basin here um, on the, the western limb, um, so you can't really see it um, from Earth. But, um, and this scene, I, I'll mention, sorry about the scales, is around 13 kilometers across here in the front. Um, so we're getting these views where we're looking for places you can find samples that were clearly affected by a particular basin. The ages would have been reset. We could go collect those samples. I'll zoom in on this area and then date this basin. So we can get down to the level now where we're seeing rocks from a particular outcrop that have you know, move down this hill and we could go pick those up quite easily. So that'll be the goal there. But um, that will take a dedicated either sample return program um, or in situ there are new techniques where you can actually um, potentially date uh, rocks on the surface of the moon without bringing them back to the lab. Um, but that is, you know, 3.9 billion years ago. We've also been looking about looking at what is going on now, the present day um, impactor population. So we know the small impactor rate. That's very small, less than one millimeter. Um, we don't get craters from one millimeter size impactors on Earth because of our atmosphere. But we do on the moon, there's actually a, a, a 0.25 millimeter soil grain. <coughs> and at the top, you can see a, a small crater and a little spall zone around it. So, was um, that one collected here on Earth? That was a lunar sample, yeah. <clears throat> a Apollo sample. Um, you know, so we know the rate that of, of those impactors quite well. You, know, you can um, learn that from, um, for example, space instruments on the space station or um, just you know, putting out a, an impactor collector, basically. Um, we know the large impactor rate pretty well. Um, you know, there are various projects that monitor, um, well, it's been stable for quite a while, so um, even uh, these big craters on the moon can tell us about that. Um, but this middle size isn't very well known, and so we do care about that size. You know, this was the, the Chelyabinsk um, fireball that was uh, thought to be around a 20 meter impactor. So these in this middle range are still, you know, they're, they're capable of doing was that in some Russia? damage. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, what is about the size for, for middle range? <clears throat> a middle range? Well, um, anywhere from over a millimeter to less than 10 kilometers. I guess. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of the things that oh, this is going to play here. Oh, this is supposed to be a little like oh, that would be sad if the little gifts don't work. Um. Okay, let me see if I can like click on it or something. Oh, it's in good. Yay. Okay, hopefully this will loop. In case it does not loop, watch very closely in this lower lower right area. Oh, we have some quick time. 
Click on that. Okay. Um, this is the PC problem. So um, what this is showing is um, they have cameras at Marshall uh, Space Flight Center that monitor the moon. So just looking for impact flashes. And you would have seen a little flash. Um, oh, so sad. Um, I bet. Oh, well, this one works. And so um, one of the things we started doing early on is the Marshall, the folks at Marshall would send us coordinates for where they saw these flashes. And then <coughs> after a while, after we had already built up a pretty good um, Im set of imaging uh, images of the moon, we could go then and compare our before images uh, to our after images. So they would tell us you know, where they saw this flash and we could go look. Yes. Uh, what we've also done during meteor showers, if the moon is following the Earth, we've been able to pick up blips on the moon with video cameras. Yep, that's pretty cool. Yeah, um, <coughs> so this, this was actually the first impact crater that uh, we found. Well, I should back up. We did find some by comparing um, our images to Apollo era images, but it's it's quite a laborious task to um, to get those lined up enough that you can really do a good job. Uh, so it's much easier when you have images from lunar reconnaissance orbit camera uh, before and after. Um, so you know, new crater, that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, since then, we've been really doing a, a dedicated campaign. This one is actually a little uh, old now. Um, but this is showing where we have temporal image pairs. That's what we call when we have a before and an after image with the same lighting conditions. So it makes it really easy to see changes. Um, so these are where we have, this is they're color coded to just show the, the length of time in between them. We're now getting a really great um, series of images just right now where we have over a, a nine year, um, almost a nine year difference between the before and after now. So. Um, those actually are um, the the person who does that analysis is kind of going through those right now, so we're really excited to see the results. Um, so once we have this huge data set, we could just kind of go through in an automated way and look for all these surface changes. Started finding all kinds of them, and the easiest way to find them is you just take a ratio of your before image and your after image, and if everything is the same, the whole image will be full of ones. It'll all look the same with little noise from misregistration or things. And where you have differences, they really stand out. So this is a 12 meter crater in here, just this little part right here. And then these are um, its rays, how it's affected the surface around it. And one of the really fun things that we found was that these craters are affecting the surface much farther away than we had really thought. Um, there, the, there's actually um, surface changes related to this crater that's only 12 meters across, uh, many kilometers away. Um, I think up to 30 kilometers away. So you take this little 12 meter crater and then scale that up to Imbrium that we were talking about before, you can start to see the problem. Um, oh, another interesting thing that we found that was kind of unexpected. Um, and we would never have known it if we didn't have the before and after images, is that a lot of these surface changes, um, you can see the crater in the middle forming there, um, and some of these rays that are going up are dark. Um, and usually raid craters are bright. They crack up fresh rock, and that rock's brighter than the old weathered surface. And so um, some of what we're seeing is that this isn't actually new material being thrown out for the most part. It's um, ejecta that's kind of skimming along here and roughing up the surface. And so that has really changed how, um, how we think about how often the lunar surface turns over, this gardening rate of the soils. Um, so a couple more examples. You know, we see dark craters, we see bright craters. Um, and all there's been hundreds of new impact craters that have been resolved. This is uh, the yellow dots here. I think when this is updated again, we're going to have a huge number. The two red dots are actually ones that were pointed out uh, from the flash observations. Um, oh, and then 
tens of thousands of surface changes. That These are what we think are either unresolved craters, we can't see the crater, or probably for the most part secondary ejecta from other craters. And we just don't, we're not seeing the, the primary crater, um, but we're seeing its effects farther away. Um, so what have we learned from this? Um, well, one, just kind of practical, one is that hazards from secondary crater ejecta um, are a lot bigger than previously thought. Um, the impactor itself comes in at um, somewhere around, you know, over 10 kilometers per second. Um, so these are hypervelocity impacts, but the secondary ejecta, you know, it's not as fast as that, but it's still faster than a speeding bullet. So you would want to build whatever kind of structure you're going to have on the moon to withstand this kind of sandblasting. Um, the regolith is being gardened a lot, but a lot faster than we previously thought. And then the impact rate um, so far from the data, which is, you know, will improve in its statistical significance as we go along, the rate is um, about a third higher than the model's predictions had suggested. Um, yes, and then this hypervelocity impacts, they cause this jetting of ejecta that really just scours the surface quite far away. And one of the fun things about this is that it's not hard to find these now. Um, the moon is a, a place that is changing, even though it, it's changing slow enough that we still have these ancient features preserved. There is a, a dynamic um, system there that is, involves these impacts, um, involves the solar wind um, hitting the surface. Um, Let's see, how, how much time do we have left? Keep talking. Keep talking, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'll, two other topics I wanted to mention, um, lunar volcanism, um, and then a bit about uh, polar volatiles. So lunar volcanism first, um, you know, just the basics are that all the dark areas here were flooded by um, volcanic um, lavas that are thought to have formed in these giant flood basalts, um, similar to some places on Earth, like Columbia River basalts, um, you know, on Tom Java. There's a big flood volcanism that has happened in Earth's past, too, but the moon um, um, seems to have had uh, even, you know, wider scale. Um, but most of the young, you know, what we had considered young here was, um, well over a billion uh, years ago. Um, so one of the things these high resolution images have allowed us to do is look um, up close and see things that you can't see at when you're at like 100 meters per pixel. So I'm just gonna zoom in on this area here, um, again, right near the Imbrian Basin, um, and show you some of these oddball features that we've been finding. Um, this is uh, a feature known as Ina, um, or Ina D, you can see the D shape there. Um, but um, this one was actually, it, it's about two kilometers wide, so it's wide enough that some of the earlier um, images had, had picked this up, but not at this uh, scale. And so this is an oblique view because it, it helps to see the topography. Um, for, for some reason, for this feature, it's quite easy for you to like see it um, re reversed. Um, but these areas here are topographic highs. Um, they're, they're like the pancake batter poured into this pan here. So those are highs. Um, sometimes they look like lows to what me. What is that? Gosh, it does look weird. That is a fantastic question. Um, let's look a little bit more at how weird it is. <laughs> This is where people really start to see it wow. inverted. But yeah, these are the highs. These are the lows, this kind of uneven terrain. Um, and usually it looks like, you know, this smoother region is kind of covering up the, uh, the lower, rougher area. But sometimes it gets kind of confused in here. There's, this is really quite uh, unique. It totally does look like pink. Yeah, yeah. In the pan. Yeah. And so this was the only one, but now we found over 70 or around 70 of these all scattered around the near side. Mm -hmm. And these other um, regions 
uh, within Mare basalt regions, these uh, cool. past volcanic eruptions. Um, here's another one of these. They kind of vary in form. Um, let's see how many examples I put in here. I don't know how far to go. Oh, this is one. Um, there's a, a, a graben that goes across here, um, known as Sisigonies, so an area where the crust has pulled apart a bit. Um, and then there's this kind of pit in here, and you have here you have more batter covering up most of the floor here. Um, but one of the things that really caught everyone's eye is um, how few impact craters, well, first, I mean, just they're crazy looking, um, and then that they, they look very fresh. Um, they have very distinct margins at the edges, especially you have, um, well, I, well, I'm not sure how steep in this one, but in the others you have the areas that where the slopes are up to 40 degrees which is quite steep for the moon, you know, steeper than the angle of repose. Um, and on the moon, when things are, you know, anytime you have this constant cratering going on, you just kind of smooth out the edges of everything normally. But yeah, you can see even on this one, there are very few impact craters um, on top of these. So um, what we think, I'll go back to the, the craziest one here, I know. Um, there, there's actually still a lot of debate about how these formed, but the um, volcanism is the you know that that's there's always volcanism involved in any of our ideas of how these formed. Um, one thing that a lot of people think is that this is kind of a, an, a remnant caldera, and that you had some kind of collapse down into it. It's pretty typical in terrestrial volcanoes. You have a you know a lava lake. And then as things start to drain out, that crack, uh, that collapses, cracks up, and then you can get like little squeeze-ups of lava that come through those fissures at the very end of an eruption. Um, so these, the, the pancake batter here, this would be that last little bit of um, lava oozing up onto the surface here. Yes? And what did they think volcanism stopped on the moon? Well, that is what we would really like to know now. Okay. Um, we think, I mean, our, our previous idea was definitely more than a billion years ago. Right. Although, we don't really know that number as well as we would like to either. It's based on all kinds of models of crater production and how many craters are on this or that. Yes. Has volcanism completely stopped? That's a great question because <laughs> we think that based on how fresh these look, um, how few craters are on top of them, that they are less than um, you know, 50 to 100 million years old. Well, 100 million years old is kind of the cons an upper limit. And geologically speaking, um, that is essentially yesterday. <laughs> and the moon could not, you know, these could be still forming potentially if, if things are that young. Yes. Uh, do, um, does the morphology of Ina look like a single collapse, or does it look like a staged periodic um, series of collapses? Well, even the collapse is a bit speculative. I mean, we don't okay. see any actual fracturing or anything like that because the surface is beat up enough. And well, we don't, we don't, we potentially would need even a, a better view, like a, from the surface, to really mm -hmm. see that kind of thing. Um, so these may be very young, and there may be some other crazy explanation for why these have so few craters and look young. <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of geologists would be more comfortable if we're just completely fooled and these really are old. Um, because, um, well, because the moon has been cooling down since it formed, and we have, um, Astronauts made uh, heat flow measurements of the surface that show uh, it's cooling down very, very, very slowly. It's pretty cold now. And so it should be geologically dead. It shouldn't have enough of its own uh, internal heat left. It's a small body. It cooled off faster than the Earth. It shouldn't have enough heat left to keep making this volcanism. So um, either we don't understand. There's probably, you know, both. Um, we don't understand what is going on at Ina and these other weird locations, um, or our models are incomplete in our understanding of the moon's heat flow, how it's cooled over time, um, and how that varies across the surface. 
because there are areas that have a lot of a high concentration of radioactive elements, and those are an, an additional heat source. So um, we, we don't have enough measurements of the moon's heat flow to say for sure, probably, um, if the moon is definitively dead. And we don't know enough about these volcanic features yet to really understand when they formed, or potentially even how. You know, we're, we're still making up models of her for how these formed. So, um, I think I probably just said all of this while I was talking. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, one of the things that we would love to know is if these are young, you know, what was going on in the mantle here? Um, what was the composition of the mantle that melted partially to produce these late stage eruptions? Um, all kinds of interesting things you could learn from, from going there or to any of these features. And if there's still time, yes, a few continue. more slides. Okay. Last topic, um, looking at uh, permanently shadowed regions. Um, I think I talked about ice on Mercury when I was here, yes, right? Did. So Very now we'll awesome. get to the moon. Um, and what's the story there? Because um, just the, the background of ice on Mercury is, you know, fascinating. But we are most likely not going to find any, um, you know, way to use that as a resource to go there and melt the ice. And, you know, um, probably, yeah, it, it'd be a challenge. Um, but if there's ice on the moon, that would be a, a truly valuable resource um, if you could prove that it's a resource um, and that it's there in enough abundance that you could use it as a resource. And the reason there is, you know, water is really heavy, launching it off the earth is very expensive, and um, actually a lot of these asteroid mining companies that you may have heard of, if you talk to them, one of, you know, they're not interested necessarily in these platinum or some totally rare um, element, they want water um, from these asteroids, because it's already been, you know, it's already up in space, you don't have to launch it. Um, you can make, break it apart, make rocket fuel from it, um, oxygen, uh, just water for drinking if you have an outpost. So this is the south pole of the moon out to I think about uh, 88 degrees, um, so 90 at the middle, 88 degrees south at the edges. And um, this is an illumination map and um, that's Shackleton Crater right there in the middle. Um, this came from well, you can make an illumination map a few ways. If you know the topography perfectly, um, you can just model the illumination. Or if you've imaged the surface over and over and over and over and over again, you can just kind of average those out and see where has been illuminated and where's not. So all these black areas are areas that never see sunlight. And, you know, the Earth, you don't get that because we have a pretty big tilt, gives us our seasons, you have six months of summer, six months of winter at the poles. Um, but on the moon, um, the tilt is very small, a couple of degrees. And so if you have um, a hole at the pole, then that area will always be shadowed by the topography surrounding it. And um, conversely, if you have a peak at the pole, it will be always illuminated. And so these areas that are, are white, have a huge fraction of, um, spent a huge fraction of the time illuminated. There um, sadly are no areas of um, eternal sunshine on the moon, um, but there are areas, if you go along the rim of this crater here, that are in sun more than 90% of the time. So that would be great because most things run on solar power. Um, you can set up a huge solar power um, area here and then dive down into these permanently shaded, shadowed cra craters and you know, mine all your um, water. So that's the idea here. <laughs> and this illumination map comes from um, averaging of, uh, images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. And um, now the goal is let's look in these shadowed regions and, and look for what we think is there, the ice, because of measurements from other uh, spacecraft. This is actually um, from Lunar Prospector. 
that uh, spacecraft that was right in the middle of those sad doldrum era of lunar exploration. Um, but it measured, um, had a neutron spectrometer that measured epithermal neutrons. And so um, the physics of it is that if you have a bunch of hydrogen on the surface, it's really good at absorbing neutrons that would otherwise be sputtered up into uh, the, the detector here. So areas that are blue have very low uh, epithermal neutrons and are thought to have a lot of hydrogen. Well, I should, I should clarify, a lot. Um, still, still pretty uh, small amounts in the parts per million. But a lot for what was expected. Um, another um, instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is a, has um, a, a radiometer to measure temperatures, and that was actually one of the main goals of that instrument in particular was to measure the temperatures of these permanently shadowed craters to see if they could um, cold trap volatiles uh, and ice and water, um, as well as you know all kinds of other stuff that would be in there. Um, and it measured um, temperatures in here, and then they've taken the, um, that and turned it into a model of ice stability. And the color scale there is the depth at which ice would be stable. So um, everything that is white means that it's stable at the surface. Um, and then you can see varying degrees. Ice wouldn't be stable at the surface anymore. It's a little too warm for that, but just go down um, you know, a few centimeters and, and you could potentially have stable ice. Um, so we've gone looking for that ice with the camera. And um, short story, we don't see it with the camera. Um, this is the outline in red here shows um, the boundary of permanent shadow. So this was a longer exposure um, image that um, was designed to, you know, everything out here was illuminated when the image was taken was saturated. So this is looking inside of the shadow. And we see all kinds of cool things here, mm -hmm. you know, landslides moving down the wall, boulders <laughs> and things. But we don't see what we saw um, on Mercury, where we had evidence that there was ice. And when we went looking for it, um, the image quality for Mercury was actually much poorer. But it was still everywhere we expected to see ice where those models showed that ice was stable at the surface, we could see it. And so that has been the big question. Um, oh, here, another one just showing the same thing. Is, um, I'll just go back one, I guess. Why, why don't we see the same thing? And um, we still don't know. We think that the ice that is there is mostly probably, um, well, it's lower abundance overall. It's been gardened into the soil, so you don't have this just perfectly pure water ice layer. And that might be because the water ice was delivered to Mercury more recently in one big impact, like a comet impact, so it's perfectly filled in all of the cold traps. Whereas on the moon, it was delivered a long time ago, and impacts have slowly mixed it in and eaten it away. But we still don't know the source of the water um, on the moon. Um, you know, it could be solar winds migrating, um, comets. It could be internal water that was internal to the moon, it erupted through volcanic eruptions. Um, basically, anything that. Um, Is it possible that some of these asteroids that you say have water on them could crashed on the moon and got up there that way? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people would like to find out how how that water got there. Um, but we won't know until we probably go there um, and do some kind of um, look at the isotope ratios and pinpoint that. Does that look like a comet? Does that look like an asteroid? Does it look like the moon? Did you have a question? Was it ever possible to retrieve some of the parts of the asteroids that got on the moon? Yeah. Um, they for the large part, get totally vaporized because they come in so fast. Um, 
but we have the Apollo soil samples actually show that there are some small fragments of, of meteorites. It's kind of like, um, there's actually a, a project at my, um, where I went to school now, that they're looking, they're taking the samples, um, some of the samples, and just doing, um, basically scanning through the mall with um, imaging spectroscopy, looking for the oddballs, looking for things that don't look like the moon, and then trying to go back and pick those out. Though, really what they're looking for is not asteroids necessarily. They're looking for pieces of the early Earth, because that would be pretty amazing. There were impact. We have lunar meteorites that have been, you know, kicked off the moon and came back to Earth. There should be Earth meteorites on the moon. Hmm. Uh, this question is not as much about water, but about meteorites. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the moon be a dangerous place to be on with that many little impact areas? Or the impact areas is limited to special geographic zones? Um, no, it, they're pretty much um, everywhere. There should be an overall a higher flux <coughs> toward the equator. Um, but, you know, um, really you would just need to plan accordingly. Um, you're not, you're not going to be protected from, you know, a, a 10 meter impactor <laughs> coming in. But the, the chances of that are, are tiny. What you have to plan for is all this constant rain of small, small impactors. Uh -huh. Oh, okay. Oh, no, no, no. You, you, this is like involving a lot of different things here. <laughs> uh, so first, um, the reason there are more impacts um, at the equator, well, the, the flux basically also involves the velocity, the relative velocities. And so you always have the Earth, you know, kind of moving <coughs> through this cloud of impactors. And so when you take it into account also the curvature of the moon, you kind of get a like a, a smaller subtended angle. And anyway, it's, it's kind of just a geometry problem there. But what you're talking about where we had all the new impacts kind of at a swath across the middle is an observational bias because it's much easier for us to see those new impacts when the sun is pretty high in the sky. And so... Um, their, you know, reflectance differences stand out a lot better. So, because we're looking for the changes far from the crater, much easier to see than the actual impact crater itself. So, higher latitudes, or, well, you know, farther from the equator, you just never have the illumination conditions that are really good for looking at, at for those craters. Yep. I guess the question about what I was asking earlier, mm -hmm. even though it's very small, one millimeter impact, if they're coming in at an incredible speed. Mm -hmm. They would go. They would rip right through any spacesuit or anything like that. Um. It's, it's about the same though as if you were in orbit around the Earth. Yeah. So you're, you know, the space station. It, it should be the same. Yeah. And they still monitor those things. There's, you know, an instrument on the space station right now. So I don't know. I, it, I agree that what you're saying sounds totally reasonable. But apparently, there's smart people who have figured it all out. If it's you're protected by the atmosphere, you're not protected by the atmosphere. No, you're not. Um, but I, I, I think though the. Okay, I was just doing this calculation because they give you the rates in such you know bizarre units that make no like logical sense to you. I think it was something like. Um, oh, I wish I had this right. It was something like in one square meter you would get one micrometeorite impact every, like, few, every month or something. So it's not as constant. But, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I shouldn't talk to things that are, you know, not my expertise here. Yes? So what is the, the, the that picture that showed the, all of the impacts, what is the average size of the objects that are averaging impact? Um, we can't give you an average because um, we don't resolve the smaller craters. We see lots of surface changes that um, we see the surface has changed. There's probably a crater in the middle, um, but we can't see it. So the average size is, is much smaller than we can see. Um, the biggest ones we've seen now are up to, I think, 90 meters. 
Um, so pretty big. Now, for instance, the 12 meter crater, mm -hmm. what's the size of the object? That oh, the would size cause of the that? object? Oh, gosh. Making me think way back. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not going to be even a meter. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. good enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. We're actually, I'm almost done here with what I wanted to say. Um, just that um, I'm working on a new camera now that is going to be really fun. Um, to actually look more in detail in these permanently shadowed regions. It's called Shadow Cam. Um, it's a NASA funded camera that will fly on the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. Um, it's gonna launch in a couple of years um, on a Falcon 9. Um, and uh, they have all of their own internal science goals, but they also wanted to collaborate with um, NASA and you know, allowed us to hitch a ride. Um, so this is kind of some technical details, but the, the basics are that this was um, a rebuild of one of our cameras that we have now. So built the exact same camera, just swap out the detector. So now our camera will be 800 times more sensitive. So we can just stare right down in these permanently shadowed regions. We can see things, you know, meter in size instead of, you know, now we smear out our pixels. So this will be a really fun, focused investigation. Um, when that goes. And... How do you actually see things that are in permanent shadow? What kind of wavelengths? Yeah. Um, well, we're, we're just looking at visible wavelengths. So what we use is um, light that has bounced off of any nearby crater topographic high and is just um, you know, reflected down from the nearby surface down into there. We've actually tried looking at earth shine. Um, the earth shine, like we'll maybe do some calibration images of the equator using earth shine and things, but that might be a little tough. But um, mostly um, just reflected sunlight. The funny thing about this camera is that it will saturate for most of the moon. The most of the moon we cannot image. <laughs> so, so it's really, really a dark camera. Yeah, it's specialized. <laughs> Say something about the water. Oh, the water. I mean, I mean, remember LRO, even, even the planetarium movies talk about, you know, sounds like to me it's twice as wet as your typical desert in some of these things. So, the funny, yeah, so many of the instruments for LRO were focused on this water question. Um, actually, the camera was not. It's just like incidental that we've been able to image them. But, um, so there, there was another um, neutron spectroscopy in, uh, experiment, and they, you know, they see hydrogen. Um, there was this really cool um, spectrometer, imaging spectrometer that looks, um, it's called the Lyman, Lyman Alpha Mapping Project. They, they use Lyman Alpha emissions. They use starlight and, you know, cosmic background or whatever, um, that light to look into these permanently shadowed regions. But they're looking at very, you know, UV wavelengths, so they have pretty poor spatial resolution. They see things that look like water. Um, the, uh, there's a laser um, that's mostly used for altimetry, but um, they can also look at the fraction of light reflected, and you get a higher fraction of light reflected in some of these polar areas, so they think they're seeing frost, um, despite the fact that we don't see it. Um, and, gosh, what else? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of knowledge we have now. And then there was the LCROSS experiment. They crashed a spacecraft into the uh, permanently shadowed region, saw about 5% water. That's um, wetter than any desert on the earth. And they eject it. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's not insignificant. So the challenge is going forward to will be to, I mean, scientifically, we're just really interested in where it came from, how old is it, how you know, how, how long is it, you know, was it, um, you know, is it like native water? <laughs> is it well, come it's from the sun? To me, the Chinese it? are going there. It's obvious. Oh, there, yeah, the, actually. I mean, um, I mean I've, seen, I've seen better images where their flag is really prominent. <laughs> right? Well, there will be Chinese So let's get serious about this. Soon. The um, Chinese are going back to the moon, period. India announced last, last month or this month that they have a spacecraft launching in a couple months. They're going to the South Pole to mm. look for water. Um, there's a NASA mission in formulation, which means it's not a real mission because it doesn't have real funding yet. But um, hopefully we'll go to the polls called Resource Prospector. Um, 
the, the key is to find out, I mean, we care about how it got there, but everyone else cares about um, how much, uh, you know, what's the grade in tonnage? Right. Can they mine this stuff? And that'll be the question is, you know, is it, you know, a few molecules, like, with this, you know, how, how far are they going to dig to get to it? Basically, how, how is it going to be cost effective for them to do that? Got to have something roll around in five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a rover. Um, that's NASA's mission, a rover, and that would go and drill, pull the material up, look at it. Um, but yeah, there's a big international. You can kind of see this ends up at 2013. Um, there haven't been any new launches since, um, but there's kind of a, a second wave of things that are in formulation. <coughs> and you probably heard the, the politics shifted again um, back toward the moon. Um, so their NASA, well, the, the president's budget will be released on uh, Monday, I believe. So we'll find, you know, until there's a budget, you don't know how serious things are, but um, we may be refocusing um, exploration efforts back toward the moon again. Um, so we'll see. It's a shame we don't have any Mexicans up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there will be a very, um, I mean, there will be a very international effort yeah. when, um, for a lot of this, and there's already a coordination. Um, I'll just mention one shame with the, um, particular for, for China, is that there's, there's a law that prevents um, NASA, anyone who has NASA funding, from working bilaterally with anyone from China. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's really silly. We can, we can work... As long as it's not bilateral. If you get like a third country involved, then you can work together. It's very strange. <laughs> I mean, Shanghai is monitoring your computers already. Um, you use Lenovo occasionally, don't you? You know where they're made, don't you? We, they all have spy chips, and anyone doesn't think that is stupid. <laughs> my work has very strict security okay, Good, but I mean, <laughs> realistically, I like the Chinese. Yeah. I like CNU. Yes. I want them to so, be extremely successful. You can see the politics always gets pulled back in when you end up talking about the moon because, um, well, in part because it isn't just the science. It is kind of a national pride. It's, um, you know, this, you know, competition. Um, it's, um, you know, demonstrating our technological and scientific advantages and all of these things. Um, the goal would be to get a program of lunar exploration that is sustainable in that each piece is, you know, whole into itself and also feeds forward technologically into some um, next part of it so that it can be, you know, it can continue along, not just these one big, big event um, and then you're done, which is what happened with Apollo. Um, so, and then, and then along the way, you find partnerships internationally, and then now, of course, we have commercial partnerships um, that are coming into the scene. So, um, I'm happy to take more questions. That's all I had planned to say. Um, I'll just leave you with this image. Yes. I noticed that we're using scope to the back side that much. Now, are there... Plans for uh, maybe uh, having like a, a thing that talks about like drawing here in the halo orbits, you know, the, the, to have a stable platform to relay things back and mm -hmm. be able to observe, maybe get, get resolution similar to what we have with the front side? Yeah, so that was actually just my own bias. So, you know, everyone knows the near side, so I just put it up there more. We now have data that's equivalent for the whole moon, um, but definitely. The challenge with the far side is uh, landing because you need a, a comm satellite, um, and so that's extra cost. Um, but there are all kinds of opportunities on the far side, especially because one one I like is that Imbrium basically coated the whole near side with its you know, ejecta. Let's go over to the far side and, and see something that has not been as contaminated. The oldest and biggest basin on the moon, South Pole Aiken Basin, is on the far side. And then um, there's a lot of talk now about a deep space gateway, 
which would be in lunar, like near cislunar space. That's what it's called, yeah, cislunar space. So there you would be observing the far side potentially from a Lagrange point. I have a question related to the far side one. Mm -hmm. Is it understood why the far side is so much smoother? And would that have had to have developed uh, before the moon became tidally locked? Um, okay, so smoother, it is, um, it is, it is actually rougher. It's smoother in terms of it, it doesn't have albedo differences, so it's all just kind of white. Um, but it's rougher in terms of it's, it's more heavily cratered. Um, and there's all kinds of weird moon, you know, we still don't fully understand the far side, near side differences, but one of the main things that we actually learned from Lunar Prospector spacecraft is that there's a huge concentration of heat producing radioactive elements on the near side where we have all that, uh, those volcanic deposits. And so we don't know why there are more <laughs> radioactive elements um, in the low, you know, in the near side than the far side. On the far side, you just have these little like pinpoints locations, whereas the near side is this huge area that's really rich in potassium, thorium. Um, but we do know that that high concentration of those elements will lead to, um, you know, an easier time melting and producing volcanic deposits. Um, and as to why why there is that asymmetry, we don't know. The other thing is that because there's all those heat producing elements on the near side, when you have a big impact, the crust is hotter and it kind of relaxes, and so it doesn't it gets it turns into like a bigger crater. On the far side, um, they end up the craters end up being smaller because they form in a colder surface. So yeah, there's yeah. Uh, when the moon formed. Um, it was probably rotating, so uh, when did it stop rotating? And uh, you know, you we're talking about the last heavy bombardment 3.8 billion years ago. Was it still rotating then? Yeah, well it is rotating now, it's just tidal. Well it does, once. yes. Yeah, well, Before, once, yeah, well, yes. Before you are rotating at a faster rate. Yes. Um, okay, so what is the question? Was it, well, was was it, it okay. rotating, was it at, rotating a higher rate at a higher heavy rate? Um, yes, maybe. I don't know. Um, <laughs> the problem with tracking that backward and timing um, is also that the impacts can affect, the, you know, we think that's why Venus is a retrograde orbit. Um, so. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly when that, probably somebody has a good estimate of when that, when the moon became tidally locked. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it would have, I think, I imagine it would have been really early on, kind of before the late heavy bombardment, but I don't know the answer to that. They don't tell you in the introductory astronomy books, I can tell you that. <laughs> I think they would if somebody knew. Yeah, I don't think anybody um, has, a, has a clue. Yeah, I mean, we also have ideas too about how this big, bulge that's associated with the volcanism yeah. and heat producing elements, you know, that could have actually affected the way the moon rotates. Yeah. It could have, we think it might have tilted the moon's pole a bit from where it was. Does the moon have a magnetic field? The moon does not have a magnetic field today. It seems as though it had an early core dynamo, um, but it doesn't um, have any magnetic cool. field. There was, um, there are areas of the crust that are magnetized. Um, and they're actually pretty strong magnetic anomalies, and we're still arguing about how those, how the, how those got to be that way. And they do. I wish I had a picture to show you. They're, they have these amazing features at these magnetic anomalies, it's like these crazy bright swirly albedo patterns um, called swirls, <laughs> because that's what they look like. And there are these really weird loops and shapes that seem to like, there's like an omega one, they seem that they might be following kind of magnetic field lines. And so the magnetic field is like affecting how the surface weathers there. It, it kind of shields it like a little mini magnetosphere and keeps the surface fresh underneath it. Yeah. Are there further questions? I was wondering about the GRAIL mission. Mm -hmm. Was that the tell irregularities in the gravity field? Yes. Yeah, I didn't talk about that because, you know, 
I'm more of like surface geology and I'm a geophysicist and I don't want to get myself in too much trouble. But um, the GRAIL mission was really neat. I had two spacecraft, GRAIL A and D, um, or Ebb and Flow, I think they were. Um, but they, you know, measured any small changes um, in distance between the two spacecraft and then used that to map um, the gravity field of the moon. And it's actually been mapped to way higher than, you know, the Earth's gravity field. Um, and, yeah, that was really neat. My favorite thing from that is these maps of modeled crustal thickness, where you can see all of where you have thin crust, where big basins have poked through. So we now, like, pretty definitively now, like, we have seen <laughs> the impactor, the flux history of the moon, you know, all the impacts that have happened. Um, at least after the crust was stable enough to, or cool enough to record that. Is that what we'll find two mascons? Yeah, there, there's, um, I mean, you, they've been redoing the modeling of the GRAIL data down to where they're, they're able to, they claim to be able to see like lava tubes, like that level of voids in the crust. And um, the moon has huge mass cons, mass concentrations associated with volcanic deposits, but also impacts because um, you basically lift out a piece of the crust and then the mantle can kind of lift up in the middle of where that impact occurred. And so that, you know, dense mantle, there is a big mass concentration that affected the spacecraft and the canal of that. Okay. Yeah, has there been any attempts to compare our moon to the moons of other planets? How it differs, how it's the same? Yeah, um, well, um, it's funny because the moon almost gets treated like um, a terrestrial, like, you know, a planet oh, in the way okay. we study it um, because it, it's big um, <laughs> compared to a lot of the moons. I mean, Mars is like these teeny little moons, right? right. And then the outer solar system moons are just, uh, each one is like totally crazy, um, you know, right. who knows what you'll get next. Have you seen some of the images of like Hyperion and all these crazy moons? Um, <laughs> and then, you know, Venus doesn't have any and Mercury doesn't have any. So then you just have this big, you know, if, yeah, people do geology of Europa as well, of course, but Europa is an icy body. We think it has an ocean. So just, there's there's really no comparing the moon. Who comes up with all these, like, names? They sound Latin or something. Um, well, the, I don't know who came up with it's, okay, yeah, you know, just a lot of them, sound. but the International Astronomical yeah, Union is in thought. charge of naming Wayne everything now. Us, but he's not here <laughs> yeah, they're very uh, particular of yeah. what they name, and it's fun when you say Mercury's yeah. got to name all the craters for yeah. our favorite ast or our favorite musicians and dancers, and uh, Mercury has oh. an arts theme. The moon has a science theme, um, so, you know. Um, but you got to tell yeah. before you can get one. So I think these bodies are named after Greek and Roman mythology. Yeah, yeah, yeah I was thinking that. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are just—I don't know who who came up with the names originally for those. So I feel like it was probably—I don't know—maybe the IAE was in charge of it. Yeah. Let's yeah. um, thank our speaker again.